Okay. Well, welcome again, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ann Baldridge. I uh, work for the Resource Conservation District of Greater San Diego County, and we're a member of the San Diego Pollinator Alliance. Uh, the Pollinator Alliance is a group of agencies and organizations working together across the county to support and protect pollinators. And this is a very special week because it is Pollinator Week, and we wanted to do something to celebrate that. Pollinator Week is an um, international event held each year. It's coordinated through the Pollinator Partnership. Um, and it's a week to take time to celebrate pollinators who are so essential to our lives and our landscapes and to um, spread awareness about how we can protect pollinators as many different pollinating species are in decline. I mean, we're here to talk about the monarch today and I'm sure our presenter, Carlos Gottfried, will be sharing with us um, some information about how monarchs have declined over the last couple of decades. Um, and I really wanna thank Carlos for joining us today all the way from Mexico. Um, we're so happy he could join us. Um, I'll let him introduce himself more fully, but, um, just to let you know, he was the president of the NGO that protected the monarchs in Mexico. It was called Monarca Ace. Um, he was the president of that organization for around seven years. And they did a lot to um, protect and conserve monarchs and to let the world know about um, what was going on with monarchs and to really spread the word and raise awareness. Um, If, uh, if you're interested in learning more about the San Diego Pollinator Alliance or um, any of the resources that we have to share, um, that information is on the resource conservation website, rcdsandiego.org. Um, and there's a page called Pollinator Health where you can find information about what we're doing and lots of other resources that other organizations working on um, monarch and pollinator health have created. Um, we also just started doing a newsletter. Um, we'll probably be doing that quarterly. So if you want to stay up to date with the work that's going on on monarchs and pollinators in San Diego, including a native milkweed project that we're working on, um, you can join at that rcdsandiego.org website. Okay, well, with that, I will let Carlos go ahead and introduce himself. You can see his, the beautiful cover of his presentation here. And thanks again, <laughs> Carlos. Well, uh, first of all, it's a, uh, it's a, uh... I want to thank you for the invitation. I haven't given this talk in a lot of years, but I have been uh, up to date on all the on the recent issues of the monarch butterflies. I, uh, everybody makes sure I'm in well informed. Uh, we were very uh, we were young and very passionate at at, at, at the time that we did this. Uh, our our group was involved over 15 years, and then we we formed the the, the NGO. And uh, I, I, I became tre treasurer for, for a couple of years. And then after my book was published, uh, uh, I moved up to be the president of the organization. Uh, during this period, uh, we were able to uh, gain, with the help uh, and support of the World Wide Life Fund and the International World Wide Life Fund, we were able to uh, get presidential protection, a presidential decree, which was unique and the first one to set a, a reserve of the biosphere. It was a new entity uh, idea of how to protect an area. Uh, there's, there's not too many of them in Mexico, there's about 10. The monarch butterflies is one of them. And, and then we were able also to get uh, UNESCO to recognize it as a World Heritage Site and uh, we, were, we were the first uh, pioneers in getting ecotourism to be a, a, a form of alternate uh, income for the local population to, to try to stop or uh, put back the cutting down of the, of, the, of the forest, which is a problem worldwide and is very serious in Mexico. And we'll, I'll explain a little further why it's so critical. Uh, more recently, of course, we've been surprised by the decline in monarchs in the U.S. and Canada. And that's basically uh, attributed to the disappearance of their, of their feedstock, which is the milkweed, and due to very powerful weed killers, mainly Monsanto's uh, Roundup. Uh, so 
are the populations that decline, that migrate to Mexico. We used to get over, we used to get uh, on an average 300 to 400 million butterflies migrate. And uh, today it's, uh, at one, uh, it, it came down all, it came down radically at the 30 million. That the, the population uh, pos uh, to think positive is slowly growing back. I think last year we, uh, the, the sites had a hundred million. So they're, they're I don't want to be negative, but it's, it's growing back again. Uh, as, they, as more areas in the US and Canada are allowed to have milkweeds and these, and these wildflowers and these wild plants, which are indispensable for the natural cycle. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit during my presentation. So that's, that's more or less uh, my background. Professionally, I'm an industrial engineer. I run a company that manufactures electric motors and generators. And I directed the company into going into renewables. We're a big supplier of uh, generators for wind turbines and uh, hydro. And now we're making motors for electric vehicles and also bit, uh, making automobiles. So we're very much uh, believe that the future of the planet is, has to do with these environmental uh, areas. So I, if you want, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. We'll, we'll start from the beginning because uh, a lot of people don't understand uh, the importance of insects on the planet. Let me give you some ideas here. These, uh, I'm gonna minimize this one here. The, the four groups on top of this, which is butterfly and moths come from the Arthropoda phylum. And in, the, in this phylum, the largest one is the Hexapoda or Insecta. And to give you an idea, and just in the, in the top four, which is the, the butterflies and moths, the bees, the beetles, uh, there's over um, a million species. And if you take the, the butterflies, uh, which includes the moths, you are talking about 135,000 species. So the, uh, it's more or less divided 100, 111,000 in moths and 24,000 in butterflies. Uh, biologically, they're not much different, except they're, one's nocturnal, you know, one's diurnal. So in total, there's uh, over 135,000 species. But the, the important thing here, and it's kind of magical, is, is that there's only one species of these many hundreds of thousands, that, which is known to migrate continental legs specific destinations and exact timing. And this species is the Dan Danaus plexibus lineo, which is the monarch butterfly. It's named after the early North American settlers, after Prince William of Orange, who later became King of England. So here's another, you can see uh, the flowering plants, the butterflies, the reptiles, the birds, and the mammals. As you can see, 75% of the species of the animal kingdom are insects. That's a huge number. Their, their evolution is also one of the oldest and longest and most complicated. Uh, consider that insects have been on earth for over 400 million years. And butterflies and moths evolved with the angiosperm or flowering plants approximately 250 million years ago. You can see there's parallel, parallel growth there. Surprisingly, some butterflies in their actual form are nearly identical to uh, 40 million year old fossils that we found in uh, Florissant, Colorado, as the one shown here. So we're talking about a species been a lot around for a long time. The, the, adult the, the adult monarch is structured in the same way other insects are related to it. 
It has a body protected by a hard shell that is made up of a membrane that permits movement. The body has the abdo abdomen and all these special structures that allow them to carry out their different functions. Uh, from basically uh, uh, obtaining nectar from flowers using their proboscis, which is a long hollow tube that is kept rolled up under their head like a mainspring of a clock when not in use. And I'm sure you guys have seen this when they land on flowers and sip the nectar. The antenna are responsible for balance during flight and are sensitive to sound and have receptors for smelling and touching. The eyes are compound and they have multi lenses. The thorax is the locomotion, the locomotion, uh, locomotion region where the legs and wings are attached. In the, in the monarchs, the forelegs are very small and, ver and barely visible. So you usually only see four legs, but they do have six legs and those those front legs have been modified to taste for adequate liquid liquid foods and uh, the sensors on those front legs are 2,000 times more sensitive than the human tongue they're also sensitive to sound there's two pairs of wings are in the second and third segment of the thorax and the wings consist of a lower and upper membrane between which there is a framework of reinforcing veins. Inside, uh, there, the, the monarch is, even though it's small, the insects are small, they're still as complex as the larger animals. And they have all the internal organs. In this case, they're all in one big cavity, which is bathed in blood. And the circulation does not consists of veins and arteries, but rather the whole cavity of the body is in a large space of blood. And circulation takes place by a long tube shaped heart, which runs along the whole length of the insect's back. The digestive system of the adult specially designed to receive liquid diet. The liquid is sucked up by the proboscis into the esophagus and can be stored in the crop until it is needed. Digestion takes place in the stomach. Now, we're often asked, uh, how can you uh, uh, separate males and females, or how do you know? The females, like the one here on the upper left, has thicker veins. There's a wide veins, of wide black veins, and the males have thin veins, and they have two uh, scent patches, which you can see there on one of the veins on the lower, on the lower wings on their abdomen. Okay, those are called scent patches. And they're very powerful. They produce pheromones that can attract females from up to several miles away. Here's a close-up of a male butterfly. This is the basically the a simple rendition of their two main muscles for the wings. And uh, Everybody's always been fascinating how butterflies fly and, and how they're able to power themselves. So uh, this is a little movie of a, a butterfly. It's a, it's a mimic. It's, it looks like a monarch, but it's not. It's, uh, it's, it's a, this is a, a good example of Batesian mimicry. But anyway, we have um, the, the up and down movement or actually a different way of, uh, of flying. And basically the, they suddenly release their, their, their wings up and down and they form a vortex, a, a, a ring, and they can twist the wings to also throw this vortex to the back. And this is what gives them their particular uh, type of flying. It's extremely efficient. So they use very little energy in their powered flight. You can see here how uh, uh, every stroke they can get, uh, they, they, they're quite, quite effective. Here's a slow motion version of it. 
and uh, so the insects, um, they're still studying how they, how they actually are able to pull this off, but they're extremely efficient flyers. And they use techniques that are not common in aerodynamics. You can see how it's released a, a vortex and, uh, and it's climbing. Now, when you get in the overwintering sites, when you get several million of them flying at one time, they're extremely efficient and don't run into each other. It's pretty amazing to see. And it's, uh, the phenomenon itself is, is pretty, pretty awesome. Now, the, the, the methods of self-defense uh, basically come from the milkweed. The milkweed has cardiac glycosides. And in nature, the, you have uh, animals that are poisonous develop color schemes. Basically, black, uh, yellow, and, and, uh, and white, or uh, black, orange, and white. And the, monar the monarchs is the orange one. But these are predators of monarchs, uh, the, the, the spiders and, the, and, the, and these uh, dragonflies. The other predator is our birds, but they protect themselves by having these white spots at the end of their wings where a, a bird will think he's going for the eyes of the animal, but actually it's protecting the abdomen and the, and the critical parts are the butterflies and the butterflies can continue to fly with only a third of the wing. So this is also a, an effect of defense strategy. But the most, the most, uh, they obtain their, their, their most protection by this symbiotic relationship with the milkweed. And they still don't know exactly how the cardiac glycosides are transmitting transmitted from their from their stomach and their digestive system into the cells they're not metabolized they're actually migrated the other the other uh, classical method of protection is cryptic coloring when they fold their wings they are they the 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 colors are opaque and they blend into the environment as you can see here So this is, a, this is a typical milkweed in Mexico. This is uh, one of the ones that's most poisonous. It's called a curasabica. And uh, it's in the southern part of the US and, and most of Mexico. Now this is the Batesian mimicry. Uh, the imitator is below. It's actually from a different uh, family altogether. And it's not poisonous but it developed the, the color scheme to fool other predators. And this is, uh, ever since its discovery, it was, a, it was a big scientific breakthrough. And there's a lot of that in nature, including snakes and uh, other, other animals, birds, et cetera. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the two life cycles. One is the the monarch butterfly life cycle and the, and the, the coincidence of, of the milkweed life cycle and how, how this uh, produces the annual migration. So we'll start, the courtship is, uh, most, of, most of the courtship is done uh, close to the uh, vernal equinox when at the overwintering sites, uh, they actually arrive and the females and males are immature. They have not uh, matured sexually, but they will, they will as soon as they, they get close to the, to the vernal equinox and then they'll mate in great numbers. And basically, uh, the male will transfer 
what they call a spermatophore in the female. And this takes anywhere from four to eight hours. So it's a, it's a, long, it's a long courtship, a long copulation. Uh, there's, the male will originally uh, disseminate their pheromones from their patches. The female will be attracted and then they'll go for a nuptial flight. He'll, chew, he'll take her flying to some place where they can carry out this, the copulation uh, and transfer of the spermatophore. And in the wintering, overwintering sites at the end of February, close to March, you'll see millions of them mating. Here you can see a, a, a male taking a female for a ride. Now the, the, the male can mate about four times, but the female can mate up to 12 times, which means that the female may take some of the spermatophores for nutrition. Uh, this is another a strategy to, for survival. So uh, the, the insects go what they call complete metamorphosis from the adult to the egg from the egg to the larva, or what we call caterpillars, to the chrysalis, and then from the chrysalis back to the adult. And this cycle usually takes approximately anywhere from uh, 12 to 15 days. It's, it's very quick and very amazing. It's the fastest cellular growth in the animal kingdom. And let me explain a little bit. So here you have a typical milkweeds, US on the highway in Wisconsin, I took this photograph. Or like in the northern part of Mexico, you have these uh, curasavica and these other type of milkweeds. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of the ranchers uh, cut down the milkweeds believing they're local weeds. And uh, the reason behind that is because if cows eat it with a larva on it, they may, they, may, they may have a condition where they bloat because of, a, because of the larva that they've eaten with the leaves. So after, after they're made it, the female starts looking for milkweeds. And this is usually during the flight uh, of the first gener of the migrant generation, the flight returning north, north, northwards back to the US. But any milkweed she finds, she'll test it with her forelegs, which have a microscopic needle. And if it's a positive uh, response, as far as the, the right chemical content of the milkweed, it'll lay an egg underneath the leaf. And uh, they'll do this and they can lay up to uh, the normal is 400 eggs and they can lay, some of them can lay up to 800 eggs. So the population explosion after the first generation is quite, it grows uh, geometrically quite large. And one of, the one of the incredible things is that the female fertilizes the egg as she lays it. She passes it through the spermatophore or, uh, and the egg gets fertilized. Here we can see the female in a position where she's she's tested the leaf and is going to deposit an egg underneath the fly, un, underneath the leaf. So the structure of the egg is is very is quite simple. You have a micropile, which is the opening of for air and uh, humidity, and where the larva uh, comes out of. Now the first thing that the, the larva will do, it, it'll eat its shell, which has a lot of nutrition. And then it'll start eating the leaves of the, of the, of the milkweed. Now, if you should remove the larva, I mean the caterpillar from this and put it on another species of plant, it will die. It will not eat, it'll only eat the, the milkweeds. So the relationship between monarchs and milkweeds is a relationship that goes back millions of years and they'll only 
developed this, and this is where they obtain their protection, their chemical protection. Of course, one of the things uh, is that these 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 larvae eat uh, 24 hours a day. They, they sometimes they'll eat right through the night. Now, here's a very basic uh, uh, the, uh, description of what the different the spiracles is where they breathe. The osmotarium, which are these antennas, is what they they feel and they smell. And then they have these uh, legs. Uh, they have quite a few of them. And they they have the antennas on both sides, so they're they can sense, but they're practically blind. They they get around by by smelling and 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 uh, and tasting. The inside of the caterpillar is similar to the adult, but all these structures and all the cells in these structures uh, during during the last state will migrate into what we know as the butterfly. It's, it's the same cells, but they migrate into different positions. Now there's, there's five stages to the larva and, uh, and uh, what they call instars. You can see the five of them here. Very, everybody's familiar with the one on the bottom, which is uh, the, like a tiger, the shape of the tiger. But again, getting back to the development the egg, the egg shell in the way is approximately half a milligram. But at the end of 15 days, it'll be 1500 milligrams. That, that having the, it'll be have multiplied itself 2700 times. That's a phenomenal growth, as you can see here. Here you see a monarch eating, and then it'll eat uh, a lot. Here's a, you see a butterfly coming out of the chrysalis. So one of the fascinating things that nobody could figure it out, so in the final stage, when the larva knows it's gonna go through its last part of its metamorphosis, they weave on, at the end of a stick or, or a limb or a leaf, a patch of silk. You can see this one's grabbed uh, with its hind legs has grabbed that patch of silk and starting to go through the contortions to shed that skin and become uh, a pupae or, or a chrysalis. And here the, a, a few days later, you can actually see the butterfly all the cells in that, in what was the caterpillar, have now migrated into what is the butterfly, and this is this happens in a few short days. And there you have the structure of the of the chrysalis. But what I want to bring your attention to what they call the uh, cremaster, and that has little hooks on it, like like Velcro. <laughs> So to get rid of the last skin, as it's hanging, it does an, it does a, an acrobatic uh, fling of the skin and then comes back in the air and with a cream master catches the silk that it's laid, that it's woven before. And that way it's totally free of the skin. So as it comes out of the chrysalis, it's only four or five hours. And of course, one of the amazing things is that uh, the wings uh, will, will be pumped up with blood for, uh, for once, one and only time, spread that they'll dry. And, uh, and after they dry, they can fly without any learning. They just drop themselves and start flying. It's quite incredible to see this. So here's the milkweed. There's about 120 species in Mexico. 
And I don't know how many species there is in the States, I've forgotten, but there's quite a few. And here you see the butterflies. The milkweed has its annual cycle in the fall and in the winter, they'll go to seed and they'll dry. So all the milkweed that's been that that that's in the Northern Territories in the United States and Canada uh, go away, and the and the life cycle of the butterfly is interrupted. And again, this is close to the autumnal equinox. And those butterflies that are born at the last generation do not mature. Instead, they have this instinct. So you come around uh, October, November, this is what you see, the milkweeds are dry in the north. So we'll talk a little bit about the annual migration. So everything in this pink map is butterflies. And uh, we used to have approximately in this whole area, which I'm talking about the Eastern butterflies. I'm not talking about the Western uh, smaller population in California, which has also suffered greatly, but we'll talk about the Eastern, uh, which is the one that comes to Mexico. And in this area, uh, we used to have 400 to 350 million butterflies. And as you can see, they used to go all the way up into Nova Scotia. There was a lot of milkweed in this area. The, the Great Plains at one time probably had a lot more milkweeds than we have today. So this is what it had. This is at the end of the summer. This is what it looks like. You have a large concentration. Now nobody knows uh, exactly how they do this, but in the first week in October, the last week of September, again, close to the autumnal equinox, the instinct to migrate starts. And each butterfly does the trip on its own. It doesn't matter if, it's, if it starts in Nova Scotia or in uh, Wisconsin or Minnesota. They know somehow genetically, they, they know their, the destination of the overwintering sites in the neovolcanic plateau of Mexico. So they'll start flying south. There, there are corridors that they will coincide. You'll see streams of them, but they, it's not organized flying. Each one is doing the trip on its own. The second week, third week of October, The fourth week, they're very, they're getting very close. They're starting to concentrate. You can see, see them streaming through the canyons in the northern part of Mexico. It's very beautiful to watch that. And again, the the cycles are perfect for this migration because the wildflower uh, cycle in Mexico, its peak is in the fall. Our wildflowers, when the monarchs arrive in Mexico, the wildflowers are at their peak. So they have a lot of uh, nectar to, to they, so they can re-fatten up and they, they fatten up tremendously. In Mexico, you can see them here. Any wildflower in Mexico, you can see them feeding on them and they regain any, any of the fat reserves that they lost during the trip and some of them supply over 2,000 miles, 3,000 miles. They will recover. They'll get, they'll get nice and fat. And of course, they'll feed on all the different wildflowers. And of course, of course, uh, they'll pick up pollen and their legs and help cross-pollinate all these species as well. the typical feeding in the, in the fall, right before, and after they feed up for a, a, about 10 days, and on the, on the 2nd of November, which is, uh, again, the timing is perfect, they'll fly up to 10,000 feet and start 
concentrating on these fir forests on the top of the mountains in Mexico. Uh, we know about uh, 20 colonies, and each one is can they can be small colonies down to half a million, or very large co uh, colonies, 10 million and above. Here you can see a colony that's uh, taken with a telephoto across the ridge there on on the mountain on the side of the mountain, and the trees are fir trees. These are oyamel. And uh, first described, you, you can see how thick some of these colonies are from this photograph. And uh, the, the official name is Avis Religiosa. And uh, Humboldt, when he came to Mexico, gave, gave the name to this tree because the natives uh, performed uh, religious ceremonies and believed that the, these trees were sacred. So they'll overwinter in these, uh, in these colonies, uh, these overwintering sites for three months. They arrive in November. Uh, three to four months, and most of them start leaving in in uh, in March. They'll start with a few on a tree, and it'll end up where they actually bend the the, the they can bend the the, the trees uh, from the weight, and each one only weighs a gram. You can imagine how many hundreds of thousands of them there are on on the tree. And there's, there's a lot of interesting phenomena. They're inside the overwintering site with a little bit of sun. Uh, the ones that are thirsty will crawl to where they can get some sunlight, warm up, and then fly it down to get some water and hopefully some nectar and come back to the, to the colony. So they, ha they have to overwinter here between November and March because they're their large fields of milkweeds are dry. They, they, so there's, there's this geographic uh, coincidence and reasoning why they have to overwinter. Here's a tree trunk. And a lot of questions is, uh, do they get tired by hanging on the limbs? And the answer is no, they have a specialized claw, which you can see here at the end of their legs, which they use to cling. It doesn't, it doesn't take any energy. So they're extremely efficient and not burning any energy. And the, the climate of the overwintering sites is very cool and humid. So it's perfect, it's perfect to spend three, three months of the year. They don't, they don't hibernate like a bear, but they do overwinter in this ideal climate. Here's a few photographs of the overwintering sites and the clustering phenomena. And the clustering phenomena basically affords them protection from predators in the, in the overwintering sites. It confuses the birds as they, that prey on them. They don't know where to go or which ones to pick because they're, they're all so tightly compacted. You can see most of them, uh, if they don't want to fly, they have the cryptic colors, they have their wings closed. And the ones that do want to fly, open their wings to get some heat from the sun, and they'll drop and start flying. Here you can see them lining up, get sun, and do a, a, a little trek. It takes turns. They, they, can, they can lie dormant on the trees for up to 10 days, and then they do need uh, every 10 days, they need, to, they need to get some water. It's a very beautiful phenomenon. You can see them feeding from the, uh, the springs. Any rivers will be full of uh, monarchs taking uh, liquid from the ground, the muds, 
or directly from the water or the dew in the morning from the grass. If, if, if it hasn't evaporated, they'll come down to the grass and sip, and sip the dew. Now, if they're in the shade and they need to, they need to drink water, they need to fly, they can, they'll crawl to a, to a place where they can shiver and raise their temperature and be able uh, to, uh, to, especially a warm, uh, uh, crawl into, into the sun or a warm area to be able to get to fly. This one's crawled into a rock that's, that's warm and will absorb heat from the rock and be able to fly. You can see them uh, by the thousands crawling onto the warm surfaces when they, when they need to go flying. And here you can see them this is in the evenings, and they're crawling up, trying to get up above the frost level. The biggest uh, death toll is from uh, low temperatures at night. And they have to get up at least half a meter or a meter above the ground so that the, the, the freezing temperatures don't kill them. They, they cannot sustain any freezing uh, for any length of time. So they'll actually crawl up above the freezing level. If they get caught and they can't fly, they'll crawl up. If they can't uh, and, and the weather is cold, which it usually isn't there's in our winter, uh, these will die. They'll be, uh, they'll be frozen to death. And we lose many millions of them every year to this. And the and the, the forest, the more thin it is, the easier it is for the cold, the frost, to, to go through the through the canopy into the ground and kill them. So let's talk about what happens in the spring. Again, close to the vernal equinox, you'll start seeing they're getting uh, a lot of them flying, a lot of them mating. And then the same instinct that brought them back, they'll start heading north. Now, at this time, most of the males have mated and will die. They die at the overwintering sites or close to them. The females will, con will start their flight back north. And they'll start laying eggs on any milkweed they find that's coming up in the spring. So the milkweeds are, this coincides perfectly with the milkweed being available. And uh, they're, they're available in Mexico and in the Southern US. So the first generation makes it up to Texas and the Gulf states, wherever there's milkweeds and the temperatures are not uh, freezing anymore. So this, well, you can see the green is the first the first area of the of the return, the the migrant generation does not do a round trip. They don't go as far back as the Great Lakes or the Nova Scotia. They they do they they do do the trip all the way back to Mexico, and then the females fly as far as they can north, and basically limited by the by the spring, as it as the spring comes in, the winter recedes. They continue to fly each generation they skip goes further north. And that coincides with milkweed availability. Sorry about that. So the first generation uh, uh, repopulates what you can consider there in the pink area. And at the same time that they're laying eggs here, and they're going through their metamorphosis and their life cycle, more milkweeds are appearing further north as the winter recedes. So the second generation, which is also much larger because it's grown, it grows at, each generation grows about 400 times, can, can, take, can take advantage of this large amount of milkweed becoming available. 
and so forth and so on. So the third, you get up all the way up to the Great Lakes. And the fourth, you've recovered your entire population. And again, the, the problem we have right now is that in this, these huge agriculture areas, by spraying this uh, Roundup, they're killing the milkweeds and that's what's limiting the population. That, that today, it used to be the, the, the forest conditions in Mexico was probably the severest threat. Now it's, it's the milkweed population in the United States and the Canada. Now, some countries have uh, now, because of its poisonous effects and the uh, negative reaction on the environment, are now phasing out uh, Roundup altogether. But the, there's still a lot of uh, uh, weed killers out there that do a great harm. Now, we learned all this because of tagging programs, and they're still going on today. There's at least uh, 10 different tagging programs, but the pioneer was Dr. Urquhart out of Toronto, Canada. And here's a tag that was recovered in one of the overwintering sites. And it, all it has is, uh, it says on the other side, University of Toronto, Canada, and then it has a number. And it's amazing how many he got back. But for years, he didn't get any back from Can from Mexico, so they, 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 there was a quandary where 300 million butterflies has appeared to. They never believed that they would do, that they would do a continental leap all the way to Mexico, and and in Mexico into Neo Arctic, uh, the tops of the mountains. So it was quite a surprise when they start recovering uh, tagged butterflies. From, uh, from, from Mexico and way south of where they ever thought they would go to. Uh, and part of the conservation efforts we did is uh, working with Dr. Urquhart, we tagged butterflies in reverse. We tagged them in Mexico uh, at the overwintering sites of, to see where they were recovered when they returned. And this was great help because nobody really knew how far north or where they went to and through these tagging programs. A lot of people ask us, what, well, what's the tag made of? Does it hinder their ability to fly? The tag is a typical little supermarket tag that you can never get off anything. And it's just printed and it says, return University of Toronto, Canada with a number on it. So the people who tag them record the numbers of where they tag them and when they tag them and that way, Urquhart uh, also did the, the, uh, the statistics on where they were recovered when they returned to the US and the northern part of Mexico. And of course, we use the, we use the Boy Scouts and other organizations to help us tag butterflies for years. It was, it was very successful. Now here, here's the, the hard part. And this is a, a photograph at the, at the end of this, of this valley that you can see here, uh, on top of those mountains are little islands of fir forest. All that blue is fir forest. But at one time, uh, as far as you could see, these were pine forest and fir forest. So all, the, all these forests, which you see now, are, which is, Farmland at one time was was were uh, were trees, and this is what we're up against. And as we get closer to these little islands where the overwintering sites are, you can see that the encroachment of the farm fields is going up further and further. And there, in some cases, some places they're planting corn at ten thousand feet above sea level. And it's not very, uh, it's not an economic uh, uh, reality, but they can, like the Indians told me, they can, they can eat corn, they can't eat trees. 
Here we're flying over the tops of the, of the overwintering sites. These fir forests, by the way, were left here during the last, the last ice age. And they're very, very beautiful. But they're now very small islands. And that's why it was so important to get the presidential decree to protect these areas. They're still being heavily cut. Uh, the, the, the criminals uh, in the country have grown tenfold. And they're, they, they've now reached out, they reached out into all different Ill, illegal activities in the country besides extortion, selling drugs. Uh, they're, they're also cutting uh, forests down illegally and selling the wood. So it's, it's a, major, a major problem today and a major challenge. Uh, the little town here at, uh, on the right-hand side is Angangeo. Uh, but you can see how the, 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 the deforestation's gone up the mountainside. And these, uh, this, is, this is located in what we call the, the Neo-Arctic uh, uh, transvolcanic belt. You can see these are all where all the major volcanoes in the country are. And we believe that the magnetic anomalies of these volcanoes, because every, every site is located on a, on a major volcano. Of course, very beautiful. But this is what we're up against. I'd say 20% of the logging is legal, 80% of the logging is illegal. The conditions of living here are not very good. The, and the, the, most of these people live below the, what we, you would call the poverty line. They're ba barely hanging on. You can see the corn doesn't do very well at these altitudes either. Now this is a this is a a typical. They're bringing down the road charcoal to sell because most uh, most of the cooking and heating is with wood. But in some cases, where it's there's there's no more wood, they're actually putting LP, uh, and the LP comes mostly from the U.S in tanks and they're break, taking them up in burrows so they, they can have some uh, LP to cook with. But this is, poverty is a the, is the major uh, challenge here and trying to get them to not cut down the forest. So we developed tourism, it's been extremely successful. Uh, some of the sites gets hundreds of thousands of visitors every year and of course, the amount of income that these communities get is very, is very large. Along with all the problems of, of, of having to distribute and administer those funds. But it, again, it's, uh, we started with very uh, small, rustic type uh, ecotourism. And today, uh, in the same site, there's at least 100 eateries and uh, the women bring arts and crafts to sell. So economically, it's been extremely successful. And the stores are uh, stocked with different arts and crafts. These are all handmade. So we're proud of this ecotourism and it has helped stop uh, most of the logging close to the, the centers of the overwintering site. The other one we developed was uh, the sawmills that were in the area. We were able to, in some cases, buy some of them and close them down. Another case, we expropriated them with the help of the Mexican government. And those sawmills, we converted into tree nurseries. Uh, most of the reforestation in Mexico is done naturally by the seeds of the trees just dropping and reproducing but we gave it some uh, 
we gave it some help. We and and this in this uh, old sawmill, we produced half a million seedlings every year, and we employed uh, a lot of women in the community. It was very successful. And then because we had these campaigns, the reforestation. These are the beds of the seedlings. And we also involved new technologies. Here's a visit uh, in 1988. And it was that photograph, I think, that got uh, Diana, Diane to uh, invite me to give this talk. But you can see uh, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, and then uh, Fernando Ortiz Monasterio behind him, who was the vice president, and uh, Rodolfo Garrio, who was the president. And the, uh, the blonde haired guy, I forget his name, but he was from the World Wide Life Fund, uh, reviewing our tree nurseries. And here we are teaching people how to plant fir trees. Uh, and how to do it. And uh, we're very proud of ourselves. We planted several million trees over this 10 year period. And, I, and the monarchs become a symbol of conservation in Mexico, but also worldwide. If we can uh, somehow get the monarch to survive, I think the planet will have some hope this is the famous photograph I took of Prince Philip at, at the site, which he used, uh, which, uh, the, which the, uh, the, the crown used as, as one of his uh, photographs during, uh, to, in remembrance of his, of his death. So that, that, that about wraps it up. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, I'm open. To, to talk about it. Wow, thank you so much. What an amazing story and um, such great information. I definitely learned some new things. Um, that was wonderful. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, while you're thinking, I have a question. <laughs> um, I was watching as you were showing like the map of the migration of the monarchs heading north again after they overwinter. And I wondered, are monarchs found anywhere else in Mexico beyond that corridor? No. And the overwintering sites as well? No, and the re and I'll tell you, you know, uh, we finally found out, we finally found how to find all the overwintering sites. And the Spanish cartographers 400 years ago uh, did a pretty good job of, uh, of uh, uh, in, their, in, in their maps. And they would call uh, mountains according to the names of the guides, the Indian guides. And the Indian guides named mountains, valleys, streams for the butterflies. So they said, uh, uh, Cerro de las Palomas, Hill of the Butterflies, Hill of the Papaloro. Of course, the Spaniards put palomas as, as uh, doves, but what they meant was butterflies. So uh, after we found out that the, the, cartograph the cartography told us where the overwintering sites were all along. And we and we went and we looked at, we looked for the entire country, and only found them in this in this region in Michoacan in the in the south of Mexico, right in the center of the country. Wow. So that's, okay, yeah. that's so cool. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, there's, there's, I've there's heard so that. There's so many different. Uh, yeah. there's, a, there's a huge amount of different coincidences and historical uh, events. And of course, the butterflies are very important uh, internationally and worldwide because of the metamorphosis, basically life and death, or life after death. <coughs> and uh, it's, it's the same in Mexico. Yeah. You'll often wow. see uh, a butterfly in, in a gravesite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <coughs> 
Uh -huh. Okay. And then I see some comments here saying thank you. And um, another comment from Sue White saying the nurseries are amazing to see a wonderful way to turn around the destruction of the forest. Absolutely. That's such a great, um, yeah, way to re you know, reforest the land, but also to involve people and, and invest people, or engage people. That's really great. Um, does anybody else have questions or comments? And here in um, on the West, you know, our overwintering sites are along the California coast. And, um, you know, there's historic overwintering sites here in San Diego. And I believe as far down as Baja, but we are having, um, we are experiencing minimal migration here, at least in Southern California lately. And so there's a lot of conversation and research into what's gonna to happen to the monarch um, if they lose the migration. Um, you know, like it's thought that, you know, monarch populations might become, you know, urban and non-migratory. And we think that we probably have an urban non-migratory population here in San Diego, but they're being found in the Bay Area too. And, you know, there's a lot of concern over this fact because they're theorizing, like people at the Xerxes Society and other um, institutions that are studying the monarchs, that this is going to stop monarchs from being present in about like 90% of their historic range in the West. So there would no, if this happens, there would no longer be monarchs in Idaho or Nevada or Washington or Oregon. Like they would be concentrated in those urban areas that stay warm enough um, or mild enough to have milkweed all year round. And then you know, there's the concern about what that would do to their health because of the spread of the OE parasite and all sorts. So it's such a complicated situation. <laughs> And you know, one that we are all trying to learn more about. Yeah, I don't know. So we're we're hopeful though. We're all trying our best to support monarchs and pollinators by planting milkweed and yeah. But it's just so impressive what a huge um, phenomena it is too. You know, the migration that they make on the east coast or on the east and the eastern side of um, the Rockies and that journey that they make is just so amazing and impressive. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I guess I'm not seeing any more questions. Any uh, final thoughts or uh, somebody had, I don't know if the person who, I can't remember who it was, somebody who had signed up at, had asked a question about the fly that's harming their caterpillars. Is that person on the call? So you're, I'm, I'm sure they were talking about the taconid fly and they're wondering if there's a way to um, prevent that. And if there is, I don't know about it. I think, you know, if you could, it's hard to keep those technid flies away from the monarchs. It's definitely a concern. Um, I'm seeing a comment. Oh, we have, um, that there is 120 species of milkweed in Mexico and that we only have a few. We have a few in California. We have maybe nine species of milkweed in California, but there are several hundred, I believe, in the United States as well. But in Mexico, there's 120 species of milkweed. That is pretty amazing. Yeah, and they're used in traditional medicine in Mexico. Okay, how, do you know how? Yeah, well, the, the most famous one is, uh, they, 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 cut, they, cut a, they cut the root of one and they stick it in the tooth and it breaks it up to remove uh, bad, bad teeth. Really? Oh. It actually, it actually, wow. dissolves, it actually dissolves the tooth. So that says something about how toxic that uh, sap is. Yeah, it's called in Mexico. It's called truenamuelas. But uh, huh. the the uh, the cardiac glycoside is very similar to the uh, digitalis, the you know heart medicine. Mm. And the, the effect it has on birds is it makes them throw up. It, it, it makes them severely sick. So a monarch, a bird that will learn quickly never to touch another monarch ever. So. Yeah, I feel like lizards sometimes eat the cat, or I, I suspect that lizards sometimes I, I think, eat the caterpillars too. Yeah, I think all animals get sick on them. Yeah. Of course, their their coloring tells them they're poisonous. So most of them stay away from. Yeah, mm -hmm, for sure. Cool. 
Well, thank you all so much. Thanks for being here. And thank you again, Carlos, for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. That was such a great presentation. Okay, you guys have a, have a great day. You Keep too. Bye. Thank Keep you very much. Work. Thanks, Diane, plant, for connecting us. <laughs> plant a lot of milkweeds. <laughs> yes, we are working on it. <laughs> we will. Right. Thank you. Take care.